Running is defined as the rapid turnover of the legs in order to move a human being quickly. Unlike walking, while running, there are times where both feet are off of the ground. In addition to the leg movement, there is an arm component that complements the leg motion. The objective in the sport of track is to run a given distance in the shortest amount of time, and the success of this objective is solely based on the velocity of the athlete, also known as how fast the runner is moving. There are three main factors which contribute to the speed of an athlete as they run. Stride length, the frequency of their stride, and the length of their reach. Whether you are just out for a jog or are racing on the world stage, the three same factors apply. Today, in this video, we will provide a basic overview of these components and the physics behind running. The length of a runner's stride is vital to the sport of track. The length of a runner's stride determines the number of steps one takes during their race. While running may seem very natural, there is actually a lot of movements performed by the body during this process. A stride can be considered a three-part process. The first part of the stride is the takeoff period. This occurs when the body, or the mass, is ahead of the front foot. This is achieved by pushing off of the ground with the foot. The more powerfully one presses off of the ground, the higher up the body goes, and this regulates the remaining parts of the stride. The second period is the flight period, and this is when the body is completely off the ground. Both feet are in the air for a brief moment, and the objective of this part of the stride is to shorten the period that one remains in the air. The quicker a runner plants their feet back on the track, the sooner they are able to push off for another stride. The final stage of the stride is the landing period, and this occurs when the forefoot strikes the ground and the mass is in front of the foot. Unlike common perception, it is best to land on the forefoot because you are able to push off quicker for the next stride. Most humans can do this immediately while sprinting, but seasoned runners can do this for miles. The next section that will be explained is the frequency of the stride. The faster a runner can turn over their legs, the faster they will be able to complete their distance. The idea is to complete the distance of the race in the fewest number of steps. When one foot strikes the ground in front of the body, the other is immediately returning from its grounded position up forward and finally plants itself on the ground. The foot can be traced to show a parabolic motion. The ideal of cadence of a runner's stride would be to have the upward velocity of the foot equal to the forward velocity of the body. Usain Bolt of Jamaica is the fastest man in history. He swept the sprints at the 2008 Beijing Olympics with three world record times and three gold medals. Bolt has one of the best efficiencies of any sprinter out there, and his 6 foot 5 inch frame helps him quite a bit. In his world record 100 meter dash, Bolt covered the distance in a mere 41 strides. That converts to a stride length of 2.44 meters, or 8 feet per stride. Bolt had a measured 4.96 strides per second for that race. Bolt achieved an average speed of over 23 miles per hour, but was measured at over 30 miles per hour during his fastest point. Obviously, Hussein Bolt does not think of this as he is running his race, but the physics behind it are astonishing. The running motion can best be modeled by a pendulum. The legs and arms both are like a pendulum in that they swing forward and quickly thrust backwards. The equation for the speed of a pendulum is velocity equals the square root of 2 times the force of gravity times the length of the pendulum. Basically, the shorter the length of the pendulum, the faster the pendulum will swing. Sprinters are experts at this because ideal sprinter form is long leg swings and flexible knees. The more a runner is able to shorten the distance from his body to the ground, the faster his limbs will swing and the faster the runner will move. Weight does not matter. So theoretically, a 300 pound man could break Bolt's records if he were able to move his legs and arms faster than Bolt did. At the end of a race, runners are very fatigued and slow down as they approach the line. This is obviously because a runner's energy is not enough to keep them going at their top speed. However, they slow down not primarily from lack of energy, but from the sloppiness of their form as they end the race. At the end of a race, form is more important than ever, because if a runner can efficiently swing his legs and drive his arms forward as he runs, he will be able to go faster than he would if his form fell apart. While this is easier said than done, it is still something that all runners should work on to drop those precious tenths of seconds off of their times. Running is a fundamental aspect to most sports. While the physics mentioned here are most vital to the one sport which measures how quickly an athlete can move, all serious athletes should consider these principles. The best way to improve your speed is to train. 
but training can only get you so far. Once an athlete is at their peak thickness, 98% of the work is done. The last 2% are improvements made on the parts of running that athletes do not think about. For example, correction of stride length by doing various exercises can increase the ground an athlete travels. The physics behind running can help any person. Discus is a field event in which a circular disc, normally made of plastic or wood, is thrown a distance. In the sport of discus, the objective is to throw the disc farther than the opponents while keeping one's body in the designated circle and a discus within the sector line. If the thrower steps out of the circle or the disc goes out of bounds, this is considered a fall. When throwing the discus, the most effective way to throw is with a spin. By spinning, the thrower can make use of the whole circle, adding both force and acceleration to the throw. One interesting phenomenon that occurs when throwing a discus is that when there is a headwind, the disc actually will go further. This headwind is in conjunction with a proper angle of release and proper spin technique will yield the best possible throw. When throwing a discus, lift and drag have a major effect on the outcome of the throw. Since the discus is being thrown into the air, which can be extremely variable, the form must complement these changing conditions. One thing that is critical when wanting to produce maximum lift is knowing that the point of release and acceleration no longer matters and that there is solely speed that determines how much lift the discus will have. That speed, which comes both from the thrower spinning in the circle and from the actual spin applied to the discus itself, is also what stabilizes the disc in the air. The more angular momentum a discus has, the less likely it will be to wobble in the air. This is also where the idea of a metal rim disc comes in, rather than a solely rubber practice disc. Unlike other throwing events, the only two parameters for a discus is diameter and weight, not the weight distribution. Therefore, it is to a thrower's advantage to use a metal rim disc where weight can be distributed out to the outside of the disc rather than having the weight concentrated in the center. Distributing the weight in this way also leads to a greater stabilization, which means less wobbling and in turn greater lift and less drag, ultimately allowing for a further throw. The angle at which a thrower releases the disc is also very important. The angle of release determines the path of the discus, which is parabolic in nature. When releasing a discus, the thrower's arm is completely extended and is coming around the body. It is crucial not to lift up on the discus at the last second because this will cause the disc to flip over on itself rather than leave the hand in a streamlined path. While many throwers seem to think that an angle of release of 45 degrees is the best angle to use, this is not true for discus. In fact, the optimal angle of release is actually between 30 and 40 degrees. By having the, this lesser angle, it relates back to the concept of lift. If the angle of release is too high, then it will create more drag and that will cancel out any advantage to a greater initial lift. A typical discus throw involves one and a half rotations of the body. By spinning around, the thrower is able to accelerate within the confined dimensions of the circle. When the thrower is performing the spin, it is key to accelerate through the spin. If the spin is rushed too soon, the moment of inertia will be thrown off and the thrower's timing will become disjoint. Timing a throw properly is vital to the acceleration and the overall release. For example, the first part of the spin should be slower so that the thrower can keep their leg long and around, while concurrently driving it through the circle. From there, the second part of the spin comes in. This is where the acceleration occurs. Once the first foot is planted in the center of the circle, the arm leaves the side of the body and whips around the body while the thrower pivots on the planted foot. From there, the weight is transferred forward at the same time the discus is released. The acceleration through the circle is what can separate a good thrower from a great thrower, and learning the timing for the spin takes lots of practice. The idea that throwers are people made of brute strength who hurl things through the air is far from reality. The art of throwing a discus is something that takes impeccable timing coupled with strength and coordination. There never really is such a thing as a perfect discus throw because there is always some part of the spin or release that can be altered to make the discus go a little further. With discus, the thrower must keep in mind that the idea that they cannot control the wind. And now a headwind of about 20 miles per hour coupled with an angle of release of approximately 35 degrees can actually cause discus to go almost 20 feet further.